I won't take too much on some of these, but in crafting a supply chain, a very strong supply chain, you have to find partners. For example, at Haley's in one of our supply chains, we partner with McDonald's in supplying McDonald's, the whole of Asia with pickled gherkins, which go into the hamburgers or the burgers. And you need to have a lot of trust, the trust based on the fact that your product is reliable, that there is continuity, there is consistency in quality, that you can, so a lot of uh, uh, trust, transparency, negotiation is required. Uh, to make agriculture really sustainable, these value chains really sustainable, you have to be careful about uh, food safety. And for that, you need to have various accreditations, you have to have quality processes, that requires a lot of investment uh, as well. Uh, supply chains require working with, for example, in Sri Lanka, you have to work across various geographical areas. In the eastern province, uh, people are not familiar with uh, the Sinhalese language, for example, but you have to have teams that go and engage, communicating with farmers. So some of these are critical issues that come up uh, when you go into uh, the, the grassroots levels in working in agriculture. Public-private partnerships are important because a lot of the land sometimes in countries is owned by government institutions in Sri Lanka. The Mahavali owns a lot of land. Ministry of Agriculture owns a lot of land. They have got water resources. So you have to craft interesting partnerships, getting farmer associations set up so that individual farmers can benefit and also finally working with pilot projects. Very important in agriculture because agriculture is sometimes an unknown quantity. Plants, crops, etc., can grow in different ways. It's always good to work with small pilots of about two or three hectares and then expand the model as we go along. I spoke about accreditations and, and certifications. Government agencies also play an important part because if you have to make agriculture sustainable, there has to be uh, the role of government. There has to be investments uh, for example, subsidies for uh, drip irrigation systems and greenhouses. And in Sri Lanka, the Export Development Board is doing a lot of that, uh, as well as non-governmental agencies, including uh, the, the ADB, USAID, various agencies, IFAD, uh, get involved heavily. If you have to make agriculture truly sustainable. I won't go through a lot of this because this is just a quick framework. Uh, before you go into crafting a supply chain, one of course needs to make sure that you have done an analysis of all the opportunities available. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there are lots of emerging opportunities for value-added agriculture, and that can come out from a very comprehensive and environmental and uh, business analysis. Then one decides on a strategy and a framework. How do you craft uh, a system of relating to farmers or farmer groupings? And then finally, how you monitor and uh, make uh, interventions to make the business model very uh, sustainable. Uh, land is an important issue uh, and soil evaluation has to be done. Modern agriculture, sustainable agriculture requires across uh, different areas that you do soil evaluations. Testing of soil, for example, is very important. Soil analysis and in Sri Lanka now I'm glad to say this is happening in a, in a very interesting way and I'm sure it happens in a lot of countries in Asia as well. Using a lot of the technologies available globally for example, countries like Thailand and Israel and in Europe have developed lots of technologies and we see a lot of that technology being transferred. Uh, some of the other efficient use of uh, resources involve uh, irrigation and water management. I think my colleague spoke about rainwater harvesting in agriculture as well. Uh, a lot of emphasis is paid on how you conserve water. Just as much as there is a concern over food security, there is also the concern of water security and as, as was seen, in some of the previous presentations, water security is going to be a big issue. So we need to find interesting ways of delivering water to plants, drip irrigation systems, uh, sprinkler systems, and in Sri Lanka, those are becoming very strong now. And all of these are helping to sustain agriculture. Uh, mechanization, you see today, if you go to the eastern province, you see a lot of combine harvesters at work across the big uh, paddy lands, which is a site never seen before, because people used to use various conventional methods of farming and as well as post-harvest technology is required. The Sri Lankan experience was going to crates, but moving all your vegetables from the hill country in crates to the uh, markets like Dambulla and others the, is not the answer. You need to have something which is more holistic. But this is all necessarily required. I've covered some of this. I won't take uh, much time because I'm very keen to show you about the, the uh, example of Haley's. Uh, a lot of investment decisions are involved because some of these investments in agriculture uh, can have long payback periods 
and there are a lot of assumptions to be worked in, and if you are an accountant involved in agricultural project, you might want to ask a lot of questions, so I've just put these in for purpose of completeness. Uh, care for the environment is critical. We will try to cover that in the examples that I will show you in, in Haley's, but definitely uh, soil, water management, protected agriculture, and organic farming are concepts used in sustainable agriculture in the modern day. Uh, these are the two examples I want to talk to you about. In Haley's, we, we pioneered the production of processed vegetables in the form of pickles using gherkins, which are tiny cucumbers, and we did it through uh, two processes. One is by providing the gherkins in bulk, and the second is through a value-added form in jars and also as slices, etc. The crux of the, the agricultural supply chain was to have nucleus farms to support groups of farmers, and these are spread right across Sri Lanka from Ambilipitiya right up to Polannaru and Anuradhapura, uh, even now in the north in Kilinochi as well, to have nucleus farms, to have outgrower systems so that they are an important value chain partner because Sri Lanka land is limited, and finally providing them with a lot of inputs uh, and techniques to get the best use of the land and get good, uh, get, get good yields, and finally purchase the produce back at a sustainable price. So these are some of the, the key uh, factors in the linkages, which is providing inputs on credit, the technology, uh, R&D, and all of these go back to the farmers who in turn produce higher outputs, and then we pay a sustainable price. And finally, these products go into uh, uh, global markets, which are sustained by the linkages that our company has with companies like McDonald's and uh, uh, the, the big companies like Heinz and Unilever and Nestle's, Subway, etc., whom we sell globally as well, uh, large volumes of pickles and processed vegetables. So that secures the market for farmers. It gives uh, a good return to the uh, companies that are in between, as well as uh, high quality products that meet global standards because of all of these processes to the, uh, to the end users. So this is a, the, the retail part of our business where we supply high quality uh, products that go into pickles, into burgers, into banderillas, which go into markets in Spain. Uh, we supply to about 33 countries globally. And all of this is value-added agricultural products coming from the heartland, the dry zone of Sri Lanka, crafted into a sustainable uh, supply chain. Maybe during uh, the, sub the question time, we can take some of the issues. So I'll wind up now by highlighting some of the key learning points, is that we need a balanced regulatory framework in order to have sustainable agriculture, a uh, strategically crafted supply chain, which is important, I've given you some insights, we need to make uh, best use of resources, and finally, all of this has to be done in a framework of caring for the environment. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Rishvi, for the uh, excellent presentation. Within a very, you know, the time uh, available, I think he was able to complete the presentation. Uh, last man has to always, you know, make sure that he he does a fairly uh, good work. I'm sure that he should. And uh, Shakti Ranatunga is, I think, well known to every one of us. And uh, Professor Lakshman has, I think, selected two of the best uh, companies in the country. That is Brandix and Mars. And it's world-renowned brand. Uh, they, they manufacture world-renowned brands. Uh, let me go through uh, Shakti's uh, CV. Uh, Shakti uh, is the Group Human Resource Director of uh, Mars Holdings and a board member of the Mass Holdings Apparel Board. As a group HR director, he oversees HR and talent management functions of all Mass uh, MAS Holdings uh, businesses, which include both uh, MAS Apparel and MAS uh, Investments. Shakti holds an MBA, uh, MBA from Postgraduate Institute of Management, PIM, a BA from University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, specializing in economics and modern languages, and is a graduate from uh, Chartered uh, Institute of Marketing. It's interesting to see that marketing and uh, HR. Good. Thanks. Uh, over to you, Shakti. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, uh, Safa CMA, for inviting me to speak at this forum, and uh, Professor Watabala for asking me to talk 
on uh, employee engagement uh, in a, a conference where we are talking about sustainability and CSR. Uh, I have two challenges, first being uh, talking about HR, which is a very fuzzy, uh, warm thing to uh, a group of uh, accountants and uh, who, who like to see things in numbers. And also having the second challenge of going just before lunch with all of you wanting to head to the uh, downstairs fast. So I'll keep it short and sharp. So uh, the, the objective of my presentation is to share with you the concepts of employee engagement and how it re uh, reflects back to the work we do as, uh, in sustainability and CSR. So I'll talk to you about the MAS in its operating context and uh, a concept called passion that we call, as we see in, at MAS, which is central to achieving operational excellence and sustainability. And how we approach this, by no means am I advocating this and saying that this is the way, but uh, what I'm sharing with you is how we have approached it in the past. Um, so organizations don't act, people do. Is this true? Let us see. And let me share with you what our experience has been. So the MAS is, a 20, is 25 years old. It's a fairly young company in the context of things. Uh, it has a very strong culture that is deeply rooted in the communities that we work and a culture that is, that is very strongly built in developing people and developing passion within people. Um, so it is deeply rooted beyond the products that we make for some of the global brands. Um, so I was, since it, I was talking to uh, uh, some accountants, I was obliged to put some numbers so that uh, just to give, give an idea of the company. It, uh, it's a family-owned business and still remains a family-owned business. It was established in 1986. We are in Intimates Active and Performance Clothing. We are a billion dollar company, this uh, is uh, in 2011. Today, we have a global workforce of about 53,000 associates. Perhaps the largest apparel manufacturer group in South Asia, and we are currently 15% of the Sri Lankan exports. So this is a quick evolution of the business. Uh, like I said, in 1987, when we started, when the family started the business, it was just one plant with 157 employees. And as you can see, the company has continued to evolve itself, starting from a cut and sew operation, going into backward integration to support the uh, supply chain that is required to support the business, and then going into divisions which focused on products of intimates, active, and, su and, and so the supply chain, and subsequently bringing in practices of lean manufacturing into a business, which I must say, when this hit, uh, this blip in 2009, the global financial crisis hit, uh, literally saved the company because we, uh, the initiatives that we have taken ha have helped us sustain us. And a few years down the line, when I look at it, um, possibly stands true to the fact that we probably have the uh, fundamentals right in, in ensuring that we have a sustainable organization. Um, so with such large numbers come diverse challenges, and some of these challenges in, in, in engaging employees is obviously a, a topic which most people talk about, is what, what, how do you deal with things like living wage? How do you make sure that people have a wage that they can live on, and not a, base, a minimum wage that is absolutely necessary? Uh, how do you, how do you re maintain a transient workforce that constantly moves in an industry such as ours? And, uh, and how do you employ these specialists who are now dedicated to this role and are committed to this role and how do you fool them continuously as we grow? As, you can, as I sh shared with you in the previous slides, we seem to have grown 15, 20% year on year. How do you manage to do that? And increasingly having high potentials, such as some, some of you, maybe all of you, who come into the business, how do you deal with accelerated careers such as yours? How do we deal with uh, this in a sustainable manner? 
And obviously, the generation that is coming in, who are always looking to be the CEO when they're 35, and always pushing the envelope in terms of the organization, bringing new concepts in, uh, be, wanting to be recognized and, and uh, knowledgeable and exposed to all these concepts of sustainability that is out there, who want to make a difference. How do you manage them? Um, so these are the, some of the challenges that I have. And uh, this is an interesting picture that uh, one of the plants that, I, that we have, which I visited, shared with me, and trying to, and the point they were trying to make is uh, the changing nature and the dynamics of the, of the teams that are with us. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, they put this picture up, and uh, I don't know if you can figure it out, but it's the same for girls who were in the previous picture. So we're talking about teams that are, we're, uh, are using mobile phones uh, on Facebook, uh, using uh, on the internet. So we are not talking about simple sewing machinists of 30 years ago. So if it's, uh, so how, how do we create this thing called passion? How, how do we go beyond motivation? How do we go beyond engagement? Is, is motivation is enough? Is, is uh, engagement enough? We believe that is not enough. Because that, that is enough to be content. We need to be passionate. We need to have teams that are passionate. Teams that go beyond simply a job. And, and this is just uh, some theory to back it up. How many of you see yourselves first as an accountant and then the part of your company. And to illustrate my example, I'd like to take our schools, where we come from, where we are very proud to say we are from this school or that school, and we are proud to have the insignia of our schools in it. How is it that we create that passion that makes you belong to an organization and do better than a simple job. We believe that there are some fundamentals that you need to have. Like I said, in, in, in 1987, this company was formed as a family business by three brothers based on, a, on family values. Today, I like to believe that we are still a family business run by professionals based on family values. And that is, this is an integral part of making sure that you create a, cu a culture that thinks of their future, that works towards sustainability. And in order to, for you to do this, you must have some fundamentals in place. And in the past, when we integrate, our business requires us to be in rural communities. And in rural communities, it is integral that we integrate with the community. We cannot live independently. We must win their trust. We must have their respect. If we do not have that, we cannot survive in those communities. Our value system must be in place. Our culture must be in place. So today, when we, when we, so when we did this in the past, we did this because we understood that if we didn't do all of the things to integrate ourselves with our communities, we could not survive in those communities. But today, 20 years down the line, we are bringing it more by design than by default, making sure that we have these fundamentals in place anywhere we go in the world. So these are some of the foundations of our company. We have a passion to excel, honesty, integrity, people-centric, humble, enough to know that we do not know what we do not know. Each of us are given the freedom, but given freedom with responsibility, not freely. And we have a strong leadership that believes in these values and drive these values in the organization. So, I think Santosh touched on this earlier. All of this talk about sustainability does not, or 
anything in the organization does not take place if it doesn't have the right, right leadership. A leader, and I, I'd like to talk about a few things, few aspects of this, not all. Walk the talk, absolutely essential. You cannot talk sustainability if you are not committed to it. If you are not willing to put your money where your mouth is. And if you are not willing to take those hard steps that may not necessarily show up in the accounts, at least in a favor favorable sense. Uh, and lead from the front. And have a philosophy of continuously learning and developing and nurturing the teams from within so that they understand your values, your culture, your expectations, your rallying cry, so that they, when they step up, they have the same voice and lead with the same conviction. Empowerment is a tool that a lot of you, or a word that a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, we talk a lot about it, but for us, the penny dropped in 2004 when we actually introduced lean manufacturing into our business. That was perhaps what you can call our aha moment when it gave us the tools to operationalize lean, operationalize empowerment. Firstly, understanding that it is the person who's doing the job that knows how to do it better. So first go and ask him how, or her how to do it better. Understanding that problems are meant to be surfaced and not meant to be hidden away. So, through this, it gave us the opportunity to take all of these concepts that in the past that we believed that were the, that were the responsibilities of the gurus who came from management schools and from, uh, uh, and from uh, universities to giving them to the shop floor teams to manage themselves better and manage their futures better. In, in, in all aspects, it is important to have a clear line of sight. It is one thing to have very robust strategic plans on, on, all, on, on business and in, in sustainability, but clearly communicating it and deploying it down all the way to those teams that are working on the shop floor are important. We have what we call a process called Hoshin Kanri, a policy deployment. Looks a complicated process, but it aligns the organization across the, across the group so that people, so that the teams know from what happens at the organization, goes all the way down to the shop floor team member who knows exactly this is my contribution to the goal that we want to achieve. And this is not only for business, this is also for everything that we talk about in terms of sustainability and CSR. Uh, talking specifically about the sustainability, I think Ranga spoke a lot on the, on the environmental sustainability aspects of it. So I will touch a bit on the social sustainability aspects of it. Women Go Beyond is our strategic CSR or strategic sustainability initiative. We, we do not see it as an initiative anymore. We see it once again as part of our lives. And Women Go Beyond it, uh, is our, our teams are 85% 85, 85 women. Our products are predominantly for women. So choosing to empower and enrich the lives of the teams that work with us was almost a no-brainer. And therefore, we felt that having empowerment as a keystone in empowering women to upskill their lives, to have a better quality of life, to have a career in life, have a balance in life, was an important aspect. And in this concept, 
there is a lot of projects that we do, a lot of initiatives that we have in rewarding excellence, identifying those within our teams who have overcome obstacles, challenges to achieve excellence and be role models for those that remain on the shop floor who can be aspired and inspired to achieve their dreams. I, all of this that, is, that I spoke of is today articulated but was not a tick in the box in the last few years. This is the culture that had evolved within the organization based on the values that the founders had, that the initial leaders had, and the teams that joined this business nurtured and helped grow. And today, we are in a position to articulate it. And as I mentioned earlier, have it more as a design than a develop, uh, the, have it more designed rather than by default. So I'd like to share a few stories. Um, the gentleman on the left, uh, Gunasiri, came from a rural village in Kuliapitiya, nurtured in a, 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 a family where the mother didn't want him to go very far to do his studies, but realized soon that the only way she can let her son achieve his goals is to free him. And therefore, he, he went to a rural school in Pandala, went to the University of Moratua. And one of the stories that he had was he came in his, in his school previously where they, when they marked the register, they said, oh, and nah, in, in singular meaning yes or no. And then when he went to this central school, they would say present and absent. And he was trying to figure out what this scent, scent was. And it is coincidental that this gentleman today is the general manager of our first purpose-built Sus uh, environmental sustainable manufacturing plant Thuruli in Tulhiria, which manufactures for Marks and Spencer. I'd al also like you to meet Herat. Uh, she once again uh, had a lot of dreams like every other parent, uh, every other uh, young girl to get a degree, get a master's, get a good job. Ha ha marry well, have a family, raise children. But she saw all of that go, in, uh, go away, in her words, like a line that she drew on the beach, which the waves came and took away, when she missed it, missed her opportunity to go to university by two points. Now we are talking about a nation that has only 5% that attend uni had the opportunity to go to the university. Uh, today, she's a manufacturing head of one of our manufacturing locations. Carlo, 18 years with the company. He's in his late 40s and was an inspiration to me because at reaching his 50s, today he's the MAS swimming captain and leads the team at the mercantile swimming events and swims in the masters. Trail, some of you would have seen. Uh, this, uh, most people think it is an initiative by MAS, it is actually not. It is actually two CEOs of MAS who had a dream to walk from the south to the north. And uh, this is as they walked into Jaffna and one of the questions, I happened to work with the chairman at the time, and one of the questions that, I, uh, that people ask us, how did you give two of your top key CEOs one month off to do this? Because we believe that they had the passion to do something different. As any organizations would do, 
We celebrate our diversity. We celebrate the communities that we are in. And we con continuously engage them. We believe that our success and our identity is deeply rooted in our communities. Today we work with 11 schools, or 30 schools, with 11,000 children, teaching them about sustainable education because they will take it to the world. So do organizations act? People do. And it is important that we as leaders rally them behind us with that cry. So what has this achieved us in a global context? Today we are a global player, attracting global brands. The era is gone when, when the customer came to us only for cost, for reliability, for speed. Today they come to us for sustainability. Because their consumers are demanding that of us, of them. But for us, we are not doing this because they demand it, because we demand it of ourselves. This is our brand that we've just launched. And I'd like to leave you with this thought um, and hope it was, uh, hope it all helped. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shakti, uh, for the excellent again presentation. We knew a lot about your group. Uh, it's the time for uh, Q&A. Uh, there are a few uh, questions uh, posted. I'm wondering whether I